Are they coming in? Oh, good. Here we are. Everyone's trickling in. Oh, oh Omar, huh? Yep. <laughs> We've got 13 people. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. In the UK. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi. All right, so I guess we're ready to say hello properly. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and good evening or good afternoon if you're joining us from the UK or some other side of the world, like good morning if you're coming from the States today. Um, literary agent and scholar, Dr. Leslie Gardner, will be discussing with us this evening the practical aspect of novel writing for success. Um, writers in general and novelists specifically may wonder how to go about making a success of your work and how to get it published. What skills are required? Is that more practical than you want? Dr. Gardner will share her experience and advice in answering these questions. So Dr. Gardner, we are all ears and the floor is yours. And okay, we are waiting to hear about your experience and your advice. Oh, that's a big order. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm going, I am going mostly to talk about practicalities and mostly about um, fiction, although it does apply, um, as I'll mention later, to certain kinds of nonfiction. Um, just to tell you who I am, I've been a literary agent for decades after um, a period in US publishing in the U.S. publishing house. I started here in London, that is, in a theatrical agency and then founded my own um, literary agency. Um, we've represented uh, Anthony Burgess for decades, you know, Clockwork Orange author, Salman Rushdie up through Midnight's Children, um, crime, science fiction, fantasy genres, um, uh, and so-called literary writers, um, which is a broad church. One at this festival, I think, Juliet Bates, and um, most recently, um, Fiona Mosley. Um, in some way, I don't know, I, I think I'm talking perhaps to people who are writers or want to be um, fiction writers, perhaps. I think, I'm not sure. Um, in some ways, you're... Um, Creativity has to focus on entertaining and communicating with the readers, and not all readers are going to be receptive to what you are proposing. That is either a marketplace dilemma or a problem of creativity and intention. Who are you writing for? Whoever it is, and there's nothing wrong um, with its being for yourself, but if you want to get to the marketplace, it's the reader who's the arbiter of its receptivity and what publishers may think that receptivity is about. At the moment, um, writers of color, particularly female, who are writing their first works are finding reception in publishing houses. Voices from the Middle East, the Near East, um, writers in translation, mostly female, at least in the English speaking world. Um, Transgender and stylish writers with strong voices too, always crime novels with the robust and idiosyncratic detectives are most appealing. The quest to see who's done it. And this can be mixed in with other genres like science fiction. There's some great science fiction detective novel writing going on. Um, and now a little bit about nonfiction memoirs of those same underrepresented voices are eagerly sought after by publishers, whether because publishers and audiences feel they've been left out or that there is a refreshing message that is appealing. It's the point too, in some respects, market driven, the editors who are acquiring are similarly, increasingly from the underrepresented ethnic backgrounds in millennials and generation X, there are the traditional white male and female acquiring editors too, but they're adapting to new ethos of writers and also crucial element, an online presence, an ebook, a different way to reach audiences. This will not change after the pandemic, pandemic has subsided either. It was already on the way. It's been 
fruitful to aim at that publishing model for publishers. Intriguing characters whose talk indicates a convincing interior honed by their narrative role and intentions, and then a story drive so that we want to know what happens next are the criteria that all readers look for in some way. Um, uh, this is mainly fiction, I suppose, but also it applies to what's called narrative nonfiction, um, which is different than academic, but publishers in academia want that too. <laughs> you know, they want, they want people, they want uh, people's stories, um, etc. Et Some also want lyrical and elusive prose along the way, atmosphere they can lose themselves in, or else or else action drive forward. As an agent who is an intermediary between a writer and a publisher, I am very aware that I also have my own tastes to contend with. For example, although I admire experimental writing, unless the story grabs me or else I'm drawn into the reason the writer is setting out a swerving prose or elusive characters or mucho commentary, for example, I can't take it on. I have also to be drawn in. I used to second guess the market, working out what people seemed to want, but unless it coincided with what attracted me, it never really worked. You know, I, I, I was never convincing. For example, um, one highly regarded but tiny publisher told me that the manuscript I'd shown her had too much narrative drive. She admired Clarisse L'Inspecteur, for example, whose brilliant immersive prose style of enveloping character is not for popular reading, but her style is difficult to achieve and her magical way of drawing you in is a miracle. Not everyone or actually anyone else, I think, can do it. And it's a necessity, but it's a necessity for her in telling her tales. Lately, um, Patricia Lockwood using internet, Twitter, social media ease has been getting acclaim. The story is eventually perceived through all the enjoyable stylistic jargon she uses, but it turns out it's a fairly melodramatic tale and perhaps a bit tired as a story conclusion, but people enjoyed the way she told it. The critical and acclaim is enough for publishers, I suspect, who want to embellish their own brand but I suspect sales may not be top notch. Similarly, lately, uh, when Lucy Elman uh, and the tiny press, it was called, I think, Gallery Beggars Press, uh, took her on. She won prizes. Uh, you know, I mean, those are rewarding for publishers too, but I think sales remain the top goal. Um, submissions to publishers have to be strategic if they have a book just like yours, they aren't going to go for a new one too soon. That doesn't apply to a genre, of course. If you have an epic sci-fi novel, a publisher who is successful with those would be receptive, but not if your character is called Lara and she's a tomb raider, or if she does all the same things with a different name. I mean, people do that, you know. Uh, and now to change the topic slightly, um, lately, unfortunately, entire publishing groups like the Hachette Group, which has many imprints, have decided in their lack of wisdom to insist that writers have agents before approaching them. There are several reasons for this. They are happy someone else professional has vetted the manuscript, but mostly it's about contract negotiations. They want someone else to take the time to explain and work through a contract so they're not going to have to go over it and over it. They also want someone else to blame if things don't go right. As for me, I inserting this here, um, uh, the more the writers I work with know about the business, the better. We're going to be more successful. Um, I think it's very short-sighted of the publishers since they will miss things even though that may seem like my own lack of competitiveness. But since there's no doubt that contracts can be a minefield and things that don't seem important return later to bite you, it's not a bad idea. When it comes to translation rights too, other countries do things differently. And while the publisher's rights person um, will know about it, it's no bad thing 
that you are privy to what's going on. If you make direct presentation in France, for example, the organization of the industry is rather different than it is here in the U UK or US, et cetera, et cetera. The big mission message also is that publishers are looking for authors with already developed social media platforms. As I mentioned, I'll expand briefly. Get a website going with news about your work ongoing too, but without publishing there. Start a blog there, communicating with your potential readers and use that link to the important book reviewing blogs. Uh, join Goodreads, start interacting on Twitter with other writers who might help you or read your work or help push it later on. Join crime blogs if you're writing crime, romance if you're writing romance, and book clubs among your friends. That's a great way to establish networks. Get onto Instagram and Twitter. And I see Juliet, who's a writer I work with, has just come on and she's really been having fun with that. Some people prefer one or the other. Obviously, Instagram is more image based. Facebook works really well too, friending people, etc. And just spread the word about you and your work. Get stories published if you're writing fiction online and articles on some of the online journals or magazines. Aeon is a great one or Medium, of course, or Hyperallergic, Hypatia. There are many, as you probably all know. And just to start getting your name around online and your writing, that gives publishers something to work with. And they want that more and more. They're lazy sons of guns, you know. Okay, I'm going to stop and I'm happy to respond to questions. All my own take on things, of course, and others might have different ideas, but one final word. Uh, just keep on writing at all costs and allow yourself to re-edit again and again. Think radically at times. You know, if there's a character that's not fitting, just take the, the bugger out, you know, and uh, refocus the whole thing, you know. Um, set the material aside for a few weeks and read again. Editing is where the writing really begins to utter a truism, you know. That's it. Stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. That was quite beneficial. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to be bombarded with all sorts of questions right now. Uh, I will start with a tiny question. What genre of fiction is the most popular at the moment? And have you seen any changes in wow. the popularity of genres? Or is it pretty much the same? I don't think anything's really ever changed. I mean, the, the, the genres of, um, I suppose that I think uh, crime is um, um, injecting itself into a lot of different, into romance. Romance has always been with crime, you know, um, science fiction, the fantasy. I suppose um, historical fiction um, really has to have a strong crossover uh, element, um, possibly romance or crime. Very dense uh, historical fiction is really kind of tough right now, but, um, and it, it's gotta be about the tutors, the wretched tutors all the time. But um, it's, um, no, I think, I think nothing, um, I think there's no real more popular genre at the time. It's gotta be what, what you wanna do anyway, you know, you, although people do cross uh, genres and um, I love uh, Tade Thompson's writing. I don't know if any of you are science fiction freaks, but he's, he's just wonderful. And he, he injects edgy cyber stuff and um, uh, crime and I love it, you know. Um, He's doing very, very well. There's a lot of, I think Afrofuturism is working very well right now. Um, but that's the same, that's that's the genre we already know, isn't it? You know, it, it, it's crime or whatever. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I will give somebody else a chance to ask the next question now. So is there anyone else who would like to comment or ask? I, I, I have a couple of questions. Oh yes. no, a couple. 
Uh, well, I was going to ask, um, well, just, just quickly to mention about historical novels. I recently went on a three month kind of binge uh, for, for, for partly for pleasure, partly for something I was writing. And I read Hilary Mantle's Thomas Cromwell trilogy, which has obviously has done very well. And that reads page to pa page, page by page brilliantly, as well as being, you know, a great, I mean, immensely insightful. Tudors, story. yeah. Well, Tudors, okay, but still, you, you buy the characters, you, you buy the detail, you buy everything, really. Um, so I think, um, and she also writes in the historic present, so you feel like Cromwell has to be everywhere where there's a detail, he's there. So it kind of draws you in. But I was going to say, I want to ask you a question that I, I read something recently about Kazu Shiguro, who I love, um, uh, obviously, he's a Nobel Prize winner now. And he said something like, when someone, people talk about, write what you know, um, don't believe them, that's crap. Um, uh, not, he didn't say that, but he meant, he meant you know, the, 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 the dogma of write what you know is not quite true. Um, and I mean, I can buy that with him because he writes novels which are really, you know, ex they're not experimental and stylistically, but conceptually they are quite, I mean, they're so original every time, whether it's The Unconsoled or The Buried Giant or what have you. But I want to ask, what do you think about this? Do you think writers, you know, the, the maxim, write what you know, is true? Or has it proven true in your experience? Do, you know, or, or is, is successful writing tend to be more um, extrapolating out from your own experience or your own interests and so on? I mean, what, what, what has proven the case in your experience? I, I just don't think how, how anybody can write something they don't know. How, well, how, think, how could you do it? I mean, you could, yeah, I love speculative fiction. I suppose um, Octavia Butler has never been encapsulated in a pod or a plant, but she can, she's been encapsulated in something else, so she can work it out, you know, I mean. But I, I, well, maybe because I'm thinking about someone like, I mean, a couple of authors I like from mid-century are Darrell and Miller, right? And in different ways, they wrote what they knew because Miller is very kind of directly, much more directly autobiographical, although he writes in a unique way and became famous and so on. Durrell, for example, also bases a lot of his very elaborate fictions on personal experience, you know, on relationships he had. They're very, very well veiled compared to Miller. But those kinds of writers are very different to the kind of writers I think that are more popular today who are much more, you know, they're going for themes or messages or, or they're just people like Kazuo Shiguro who are geniuses. But the point being that there, I, I don't see as much as I have before in fiction, not in memoir, but in fiction, people writing in that much more brazenly uh, autobiographical way. Or is that not true? Am I, am, I, am, I, am I missing out a lot of a lot that's out there? I mean, because I think you can, you can write amazing fiction. I think it's possible to write amazing fiction, which is very, you know, 50% based on autobiography, if you have the right technique, you know, if you can, if you can veil it enough into a, 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 a gripping narrative. Um, <clears throat> so what would your I advice suppose, be? Um, I suppose that I, I, I don't um, interrogate the manuscripts I read in that way. Yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. give a shit, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, if it, if it works and I'm enjoying it, um, I don't care where they where they got it from. If that's convincing, you know. Right. I, mean, I don't know what Catriona is jumping out of her seat there. So I, she may have something to add in here. But I, I, I was going to ask a complimentary question. Um, how would you define wondered, yeah. narrative nonfiction? What about narrative nonfiction? Um, how do you define it? Is it things like Dava Sabel's Longitude or? Um... Do you read the New Yorker? I read the occasional article in there, yeah. Well, you see, it's very, um, every time someone's making a serious point, we're, we're reading about the man or woman who's um, invented it, you know, or who's, in other words, there's a lot of people and story yeah. and motivation th that brought them to make their discovery or okay you know, yeah and it we're, we're we're getting a trajectory of um mm -hmm. a, a novel's trajectory beginning middle end characters oh, yeah. you know yeah. that that's uh and the the academic because i i 
write the most boring academic stuff myself. And I, I know I don't have to worry about that. You know, I yeah. just, um, I, I've learned that I have to follow an argument, mm -hmm. but that's different again, mm -hmm. you know. So narrative nonfiction would be something like uh, Michael Pollan's book about um, uh, psychedelic drugs, for instance. Changing Malcolm Gladwell is a perfect example. Yes. It's kind of journalese, you know, it's a yeah. little bit journalese. Yeah. I mean, it's substantive. I actually think Cass Sunstein, I don't know if you ever read him, but he's, um, he's capable of that. And strangely, um, the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, Okay, yeah. She, you read some of her her um, beautiful books. I mean, yeah. she's talking about her relationship to her daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, as she's talking about desire and she's uh, um, building a philosophical argument. That That's practically narrative nonfiction. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Where are you? Yeah, Where that are, makes a bit more sense. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. But no, they're great. There are also great historians who write biographies and histories yeah. which read like narrative. You know, Peter Gay's Freud biography, for example, yeah. big chunky volume. It, it, it reads like a novel. I mean, yeah. it's an, yeah. one of the most readable biographies, and yeah. it's still you know considered you know the academic novel, uh, the academic biography. But it reads. I mean, it reads. It was fun. It, it wasn't yeah, just yeah. informative. You know, so the, but I think it's uh, uh, yeah. Um, what did I want to say? There was one other question I wanted to ask. <laughs> but I've forgotten what it was now. Sorry, I'll come. It'll come back to me. Sorry. No worries. Uh, Katriona, the other Katriona with a C, uh, just put in a comment in the chat box, which I think rings very true. I wish academics would learn to tell a story better. I mean, this is oftentimes we do come across this problem where you read on and on and on, and nothing really happens. So it's like when. You know, when you read Ulysses by uh, James Joyce, which is great, but nothing really happens in it. And then the tapeworm effect, to, to quote Jung on it, it takes place. Well, and then... uh, if you read um, Catriona's book about cult heroines, which um, she's not talking about, but I will, is immensely readable, full of stories. And, and you're getting her, her, um, her points about this collective... Um, well, collective mythical unconscious, et cetera, that she's talking about. Mm -hmm. It's very readable. Um, and yeah, okay. that's, I wish more academic books were like that. And, and some really are, you know. Um, who who asked the who, history who, is, for example, or biography, maybe biography isn't, you know, the Wittgenstein volumes, uh, for example, of his biography. What is it, Ray Mudd or something? Ray Monk, Ray Monk. They're very readable. They're, they're, you get a real taste of what um, Wittgenstein was like to, to be with, you know. And Margaret Macmillan's histories as well. Oh, yeah. Who, who said that they wished academics could tell better stories? Who was that? Catriona. No. Because Catri Catriona, can I just say, on, if you don't mind this kind of inter AD festival plug, I'm giving a talk on Sunday about about this point about actually why why don't like professors or people who know a lot about technically about literature why don't they do more of their own fiction? And I think the often often the answer I've asked loads of them at different times. I think the answer is that <clears throat> often enough um, academics just can't do it. It's not because they're they don't want to, it's just because it's a different kind of imaginative uh, really, uh, capacity, really, you know, they, really. they can't do narrative, they can do analysis, but not narrative, you know. Um, you know what, Omar, if I may say, some of the um, academics I work with, they'll, they'll say to me, um, oh, I've got a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and my heart flips, you know, I, I think, oh, my God, but um because it, it, it's such a different skill. I mean, when, I, when I'm working with journalists as well and they want to write a, a book, my heart tends to sink too because it's a whole different um, mode. You know, um, film writers tell me, oh my God, I want to write a novel. I thought, oh shit, you know. So it, it's, um, there are different genres and you're good at it or not. Um, I think short story writers can be very good writing films, for example, I've discovered, you know, um, 
novelists can write good nonfiction, but it doesn't always work the other way around. I, I have discovered over the years, you know. Um, I mean, if Catriona were to tell me I'm going to write some science fiction, I might listen because because when I read her her recounting her uh, in her her academic volumes, she's recounting stories to make her points, and they work actually. Um, you know, I find you know, you the link of your book in the in the chat box. I'll I'll dig it out. Thank you. <laughs> A little plug. <laughs> no, I, good. I, I, I find in trying to get any kind of theoretical point across to students, though, it's which is teaching, I suppose, which is not quite the same as academic writing, but I, I can't help but want to tell people about the characters that involve are involved. Yeah. If I'm talking about surrealist cinema, you really have to understand something about Andre Breton and, and his gang to mm -hmm. sort of really understand why surrealism was the way it was. And maybe it's because my very first love was history and that was my first degree. Mm -hmm. And history is really all about how you construct your <laughs> stories and the characters. And yeah. it's, but, the, but the same is true about, I don't know, Foucault or Marx or, you know, it, it is about the, the people who wrote those. So so I, I always think that academics should be better at telling telling a story than, than it, it kind of turns out that they are, although I slightly realise we're here to talk about novels, so. <laughs> well, some, I mean, Juliet, who's, I can't, I can't see her, maybe she's there, maybe not, but, but um, she's, she's an art teacher, I mean, at university level. And here she's writing a very impressive kind of historic, oh, there you are. I am. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's kind of a historical uh, um, delving into history. And of course, because the theme of the novel that we, we've been working on together, for example, is um, synesthesia, you know, and colors. Um, well, being an art teacher, it really being in art, I should say, really helps um, to bring a veracity to the characters, but they really live and they really suffer and live by their visual sense. So it's back to what Omar was saying, who's, I guess, gone, but he, oh, I'm here. you know, oh, right. oh, there you are, but, um, you know, it's what she knows uh, that is, it, is infecting the whole novel and giving it a veracity and drawing, engaging us, really engaging us. And it's quite a tragic story that she's telling, but this is bringing us, bringing us in. It's actually wonderful, and you know. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to say something to Catriona Miller, if I might. I mean, I think it, the same, what you were saying, I think the same applies to reflection or philosophy because it's something I'm interested in on Sunday. I'm gonna talk about how when a critical writer is being creative, it's partly what his or her insight, his or her analysis means very little if it's not set against the narrative upon which the realization came from. So the story of how you came to your truth, whatever it is, is integral to the value of that truth. You cannot detach a really worthwhile insight as a given and sort of give it to people and say, well, that's the truth. That's a bit of experiential wisdom. It actually has to be attached to a narrative by how you how it came sprung up in you. And that's one of the ways I think that critical thinking or critical writing shares with creative writing is that it is a story in the end of the day. And it doesn't mean anything if it's not part of a story uh, implicitly or explicitly. So yeah, um, so I think uh, that's something I'm interested. I'm interested in how creative writers, as I think, as Leslie says, there's loads of examples of creative writers historically who write critically, you know, Virginia Woolf, George Orwell, et cetera. But the critical writers who then try to move into creative is a much more rare phenomenon. There are people though, David Lodge, Iris Murdoch, uh, George Steiner did some fiction. You know, there are some people who do it like amazingly, like better than their nonfiction. And then it begs the question, why the hell did they do more? And that really pisses me off because I don't understand why they didn't do more if they can do it so well, you know. So <laughs> they didn't get the. It's a very, um, it's very difficult to make money as a fiction writer, you know. 
Um, you can probably, and, and, and you know, uh, you've got you've to gotta keep your mind on that if you have a, you know, you have to eat and you've got to live somewhere. And, you know, so it, it takes time to write fiction, you know, I mean, um, and it, it may not bring in the box, you know. I have a question um, by, by Maria Donovan, author Maria Donovan, who well, gave a wonderful her. session. Yeah, oh, oh, you answered her already. Okay. Yeah, I answered her because I thought um, short stories, um, short stories are difficult, but it depends how they weave together. Um, and if they're absolute, if you've written the Dubliners, well, it's going to work. Yeah. But it's it's a very tough way to um uh it actually because ebooks are shorter, um it it is a possible it has become attractive to publishers to do a good solid collection of short stories. Um because they're they're um they can accommodate it shorter but if, if you're going into a bookstore you know and you're you're paying um in this country 20 25 quid pounds you know for a book and it's short stories oh you're gonna and slim yeah you're gonna think twice but if you're getting an ebook for um you know 4.99 well maybe you'll do it you know so mm -hmm. it so short stories um I think you're 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 right, Maria. I mean, it it is possible. It is possible, and they just got to be real good. Hmm. I was thinking also that in terms of ebooks, novellas might be more yeah. acceptable yeah. than yeah. You know, they would be in um, you know, uh, actual form. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You're quite mm. right. I Thank mean, you. I would I would pick up a collection of st short stories by. An author whose novel I've read and enjoyed. So, you know, you, I kind of always feel that you need this novel. And then after that, like after one good novel, whatever you write kind of sells. Is that right? Or, I mean, out of my experience as a reader, that's what I do. Like I read something really good by someone and then I see another collection of short stories by that same someone, I would automatically pick it up. Yeah, you, that's the, the, the usual pattern is a novel first and then, yeah. yeah. Well, I was reading that a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was reading Diana Ethel's, one of her late memoirs. And she's talking about her discovery of V.S. Naipaul when he was young. And so he'd given her as this young editor, um, a volume of short stories. And she was really surprised about how expert and magisterial they were, because they were, but, she, but they wouldn't, they didn't publish him until after he'd published The Mystic Masseur, which was his first, I think his first comic novel. Or So I think that that shows it, that even if you are, you know, a literary genius, um, the market, even back then, let alone today, I think that's true. I think novel, you have to kind of have a name before you can make any headway with short stories because yeah, no, one's, yeah. no one's really that interested in unless, you know, we've already got some sort of headway, I think. Mm, I think hey, so. We have another question here by... Carol Morrow. Uh, Carol asks, uh, this discussion reminds me of the art critic John Berger, who wrote a number of novels. I've read his ways of seeing, but haven't yet read his novels. Just know a bit about them. Anyway, he may be an example of someone who writes academically, and that way that work infused his creative writing. So sorry, it was actually a comment, not a question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I saw it too, and I, I think, um, I think um, when I read John Berger's, um, how do you guys say it, Berger or Berger? Anyway, when I when I read his novels, as I'm, I just mentioned to Carol, I, f I find it, um, I find them a bit dry. They're they're very um, theme pointed at theme, you know. Um, but that's because of me. I I I like I'm a real meat and potatoes um, reader. I, I like. I, I want to have a really good story, you know, and uh, characters. And he's not quite focused on that in his novels. That's cool. He's very, very highly regarded as a novelist. Um, like I was saying before, I got a, I got a, 
in terms of my work, you know, I have to really latch on to what I'm reading, to particularly somebody new. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you all it's it, it's history now, but when I was trying to sell a book called Midnight's Children, which everybody knows, I think mm -hmm. now, most people I showed it to were turning me down. I got many, many turndowns. In fact, some people, I got him to take what I said before, I got him to take out one character that was a crutch, and that was about 10,000 words. As you can imagine, because it's a very long novel. But um, now when I meet publishers, I'll say, oh, uh, you know, I mentioned Midnight Children, they'll say, oh, I loved it. <laughs> no, they didn't. You know, they, they turned me down. <laughs> You know, they just forgot. So it, it's very, um, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's very subjective, you know. Hi. Um, we also have another question from Catriona, Catriona Miller. Uh, do agents slash publishers keep an eye on the potential for film slash TV adaptations when picking up novels? Might that be a deciding factor? No. Everybody, everybody thinks their novel could be a film. <laughs> everybody, I t everybody who gives me a novel says, and you know, I think it would really make a great film or TV series. That's because, the, uh, you know, that's because they've been visualizing it as they write it. And, um, you know, Katriona will know about this. Gosh. Um, but, um, and I think that, Publishers, editors are inured to that. You know, they, they, they have learned. Even if I opt get a, get a book option, a novel option, it may never happen. You know, so it, um, it, it's it's a good quick plug. You know, um, uh, in the marketplace, you know, you can announce, oh, uh, you know, Warner Brothers picked it up for an option. Yeah, right. Okay, good. And then, and then it doesn't happen. I look at uh, Clockwork Orange is a great example. That took years and years and years, you know. Um, and I, I would say um, with Anthony Burgess, because he had that one great success, every novel, every time, he was very prolific. <laughs> every time a novel showed up, all these producers and television people would say, hey, Leslie, you know, blah, 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 let's, you know, Nothing ever came with anything, you know. So it's uh, no, it's not. But I mean, he, 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 Andy Burgess, who I love, is is has got a novel which which might be more filmable than Clockwork Orange, like Earthly Powers, or. Uh, Are you going to so, do it? Have you got the money? Well, no, but, but I was going to say about your comment about Warner Brothers optioned it. So what? Well, the author's got a lot of money from that. So from their perspective, I don't. I mean. They didn't, right? Oh, okay. But, you know, no, I heard from remember the author is getting underlying rights. Okay. As an author, where you're going to make money out of a movie is the sale of the books. You'll oh, I get, see. You'll get X amount of money for the rights. And, it, and it, it sounds like a lot. You know, it's a lot of money, you know, whatever. But no, the real money is the sale of your books on the back of the film. Right. Films and television series are really good for book sales. We have a comment uh, by Catriona with a K, Catriona John. Uh, Anita Bruckner was another academic, between parentheses, art historian who was also a novelist. Um, we have a, another comment by Dr. Kristen Murray. Uh, Kristen says, Maria mentioned novellas. Are they as respected as novels? Just finished Grief is the Thing with Feathers. I loved it. Okay, now which, where is her comment? Uh, the last one. Kristen's comment is the last one, according to my chat box. Because I'm, I'm, I, um, I can't quite hear the name of the uh, author you're saying. It's blurred in the... Uh... I think it's Max Porter is the author of that. I mean, I just haven't read many novellas lately. I mean, historically, but lately I've been reading some amazing ones. Just wondered, like in the industry, um, is there a real divide 
between novel and novella, or is it just all novel now? I mean, do, do, do you really make a, a distinction there? A distinction with what? Uh, a novella, like a shorter novel. Oh, but, um, yeah. There, there is a distinction between novella and novel, yeah. Um, because, because of the retail price of the book in the stores, you know, I mean, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna go into, are you gonna pay, you know, um, 45 quid, well, I'm, I keep referring to British sterling, but are you gonna pay that for a very thin book, you know, even if the publisher makes the typeface very large, big margins, you know, to make it fatter, a novella is a novella, you know, um, and some publishers specialize in that, you know, and, and so their business model is therefore different. So somebody buying it in a store can afford it, even, you know, even if it's very small, you know. So yeah, there is a distinction. Thank you. If I got your question right. Yes, yes, thank you. Leslie, what's with the, um, I mean, so many people nowadays are publishing on Amazon. How detrimental can that be to their potential as you know, a famous writer or novelist? They're publishing on what? On Amazon or whatever, you know, the self-publishing. Um, they publish first as an ebook, for example, they mm -hmm. publish online. A lot of publishers are using that model, yes. Um, and it's kind of a, it's a way to, again, it, it's what I'm talking about. It's a way of building up an audience, building up a platform for yourself, you know. Um, some books, you know, if it's really, um, uh, well, some of these, well, the, the book I just got in today by a, a crime writer, it's quite a chunky book. Her first novel was done as a uh, as an ebook, and then it was doing so well. They thought, oh, maybe we can, you know, make some more money at it by doing it as a as a as a, as a physical book, and they did. Um, so the next one they did first as a physical book, but you know, there, as you know, there's something called print on demand. Yeah. So if you see a book, uh, an ebook, that a lot of publishers will. Now, it, 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 a couple of years ago, they didn't do this. You know, um, uh, they used to line up with Amazon has a, um, a physical book uh, company that they work with. They would refer you there, but to do a separate deal. But now they it's incorporated um, into the ebook deal. When you do a deal for an ebook, you're also selling volume rights. You're also selling rights to. Uh, to make a short story long. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not that, I mean, it, it doesn't really impact the future of a writer negatively if they don't start out with a publisher. No, 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 no. It, it's again, it's about um, drumming up an audience with that. Right, definitely. Mm -hmm. Good Goodreads or, all, or, 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 or book clubs or Twitter, they're all responsive to uh, eBooks. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter. And you want to get lots of reviews on Amazon, you know. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, if if I'm known to be, however, an agent for for a writer, you know, and I want to put a, if I want to review Juliet's book, Amazon knows our relationship, so they'll jump on me, you know. But I, if I get my sister to do it, you know, uh, who has a different name, and my sister's very obliging, as are my sons, you know. Um, They'll do it. They'll they'll do it for me. It helps to churn it up, you know, because booksellers like to see that. They like to see that there's a lot of. That's why I'm sure you all uh, know um, Met Galley. Do you? You know, um, that's a, a way to review books um, that are coming up because the publishers want reviews. They, and then they're going to ask you to put it on Amazon, you know. Um, it's all about drumming up an audience for yourself, you know. Um, you know, I could say a lot about that, but I, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, uh, the pandemic had an effect on the amount of writing that was getting done. So, I mean, I know that it's, of course, 
if we, we cannot have unrealistic expectations of, um, you know, writing King Lear while, while we're mastering sourdough or something during the pandemic. But, but there was, you know, there was a change. Oh, yeah, people were, I, I've got piles of manuscripts people were writing. Okay. But I, I realized I didn't mention one thing and I, I forgive me if I'm backtracking a little bit, um, just about self-publishing. Um, I have a writer I've been working with. He's now, um, I think we're on our, must be our ninth novel together. He's a genre writer, you know. Um, he probably writes too fast, whatever. He's successful. But before we met, he was self-publishing. And it's only on about the sixth or seventh novel that we did together that the publishers are starting to make more money than he did when he was self-publishing. Because he's dynamite at getting his books around, uh, uh, going on blog tours, even before he was with a regular publisher. And what, what um, I did when I first met him, I put some of his titles, I used our imprint so that it didn't look like he was self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And he took a dive. It was, it was better when he was um, some, anyway, that, that self-publishing is not to be sneezed at, but it is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Right. So anyway, it's, that's um, it, it's a good way to build a profile. And as you said, it's a good way to drum up an audience as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. most definitely, most definitely, mm -hmm. yep. Ooh, there's a new message. Yeah, uh, by Tamara Abitali. Uh, Tamara asks, I have the same story. I self-published my book and I just got a deal with a publishing house to republish it for a second edition under their house. So it's actually a comment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations, Tamara. Yeah, yeah. That's very tough because when you when you when I show a manuscript to a publisher, they immediately look. If they like it. They immediately see um, if they've published online anywhere before, you know. Mm -hmm. And if they've published the very book I'm showing them, that can often be a turnoff. Uh huh. Okay. Right. So thank you so much, Leslie. Um, that was very enlightening. I mean, you shed a lot of light on. So many of our questions. I don't know if there's something else you would like to say, or if you would want to take one more question before we go. It's I. I think I've probably said everything and more. Okay. Is there is there anyone in the audience who would like to say something else or ask Leslie another question? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. You know how busy you are. Well, everybody's busy, but thank you all for coming and uh, some very interesting uh, questions. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you for being here, thank you. everyone. Thank you. So see thank you again. You. Nice to bye -bye. meet you. Bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>